Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Yes. Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Great. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everyone. It is one o'clock, so we will, one o'clock mountain, two o'clock central. So we will get started. Um, so this is uh, number two in our Food and Families virtual coffee break series. Um, it's about midsummer planting 101. And so as gardeners, um, a lot of us are looking to grow more, grow longer, and so hopefully you will learn some, get some good tips here on how to do that. We'll do a few introductions. Um, just, um, my name is Prairie Walkling. I'm a family and community health field specialist for SDSU Extension, and I'm based in Rapid City. Uh, Lisi is our moderator today. She is um, from Extension also in Rapid City. And then we have um, Dr. Rhoda Burroughs. So there she is, <laughs> a horticulture professor for SDSU, also based in Rapid City. So that's... All right, and then I wanted to um, just put a plug for my colleague, Audrey. Audrey Ryder, she is doing our August coffee break. That'll be August 11th at the same time, One Mountain, Two Central. And it's titled Preparing You and Your Kids to Start the New School Year. And since we had kind of an abrupt end to our school year um, last year, and it will be a bit different probably in the fall, um, Audrey is going to talk about that. and. Um, also share some resilience tips for parents and children. So that sounds like a, a great topic. You can register for free for that. And just a bit of housekeeping. The session will be recorded and will be available on YouTube. If you would please type questions into the chat box. Uh, Lisi is gonna help monitor that chat box and we can address those throughout the call or at the end as as they come up, um, feel free to, to ask questions along the way. And after the call, you'll get an email with the YouTube link and a copy of the PowerPoint. So to start out, um, it's always a good idea to know your zone because uh, midsummer planting can look a lot different based on where you live. So this is intended for South Dakota gardeners who are in zones three through five and planting for a fall harvest in South Dakota, usually um, it takes place late August, excuse me, <laughs> late June through August. And so that is just a map of the zones of South Dakota. And so you are really wanting to consider, um, these are four important factors when you're planting in midsummer. You wanna know your local average light frost date, uh, killing frost date, know your cold hardiness of your plants, and then know your dates to maturity. So succession planting, you may have heard this term before and a fall garden is a type of succession planting. Um, there's a few ways to do it. You can, um, it can be planting one crop several times. So planting beans at a one or two week interval, or it can be planting a crop into an area where one has already been harvested. And we always think of peas because um, they, um, you know, I'm still harvesting peas at home, but they are kind of starting to crisp up and they will, they don't last, you know, they are going to, they're going to need to be pulled out and not too long. So why do succession planting? Um, many vegetables are at their prime stage for only a short time. 
and one planting and will only be of good eating quality for less than two weeks. It's kind of amazing. And so if you have planted um, a week behind or a couple weeks behind, then you have more vegetables available, um, good quality veggies at a, for a longer time. And then, um, <laughs> This, um, sorry, I cannot see the, <laughs> the bottom of my screen here. And it also avoids your um, non-productive, to have just open space in your garden that where nothing is and your, it'll make your weed control easier. So terms, um, <laughs> I was getting a little confused between frost and freeze and um, I would just recommend don't get don't get bogged down in terminology. Um, you don't need to be a, a meteorologist to garden. <laughs> and I learned from Rhoda that most plant tissues can survive down to 28 degrees. Um, and when she is teaching master gardener classes, she tells participants um, just ask an experienced gardener in your area when this usually occurs when you when you get your hard your your light frost and your killing frost and they'll be able they'll be able to tell you so this is a map of um, from nrcs and it's south dakota average dates of your first autumn freeze um, it's from 2016 it's when the map was created so you can see you can find your county and you can see um, that usually occurs here in mid-September um, up to the first week or so in October. So I'm going to find where I live, which is like right here in Meade County. And I live in one of those lucky areas that sometimes doesn't get a their first frost until the first week of October. So, so we'll see if that happens. Um, and I asked our, our state climatologist if she had any predictions for, for our fall and she said it's too early. So I don't have any, sadly, I don't have any insider information to share with you on that. <laughs> this is a map of our, our first light frost um, date. And this is from, let me see that. It'll be backwards, but this is Vegetable Gardening in South Dakota. This is a publication that Rhoda has, has done. It's available for free as a PDF on our website, or if you prefer a hard copy, we have these in a lot of our extension offices. You can pick them up and we have them in Rapid City, for example. And on the back of it, we have these maps. So this is our, this is the spring frost and this is the fall, the fall frost dates. So this one is a little different though. This is for um, that, that light frost uh, around, maybe around 36 degrees. And you can, so you can find your county and just see when that is going to be. So that light frost date for where I live here in Mead, the tip of Mead County is, um, you know, the end of, so the end of September or so. It's when when I'm looking at that probably happening and then in this here's a little chart here for Rapid City that shows some of these important temperatures and then the probability of those dates and when you're likely to reach those so those kind of charts are available too so this is um, more your killing frost date around 32 degrees and this data is from uh, 1983 to, to 2012. And Rhoda and I were saying there's almost a decade of data that could be plugged into this map. And um, maybe we'll work, we, we'll work on that. And because that would be interesting to see if some of these, some of these dates have changed in the past eight years or so. So again, I'm going to find where I live and that killing frost is going to happen about that 
end of September date. Um, if we're lucky, maybe into October. Looks like a little bit of possible red, redness there. So those are really good maps and they're, um, they're available on our website. This um, succession planting chart is also in, in this book. Um, so we just went with mid-September. Um, you're pretty safe, um, you know, thinking about that date as our, as our first frost date. So these are some veggies that you are likely to have success with in your in planting midsummer for a fall harvest. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, there will be some others, you know, rutabaga, or we just we kind of tried to go with what um, is commonly planted. Um, so green beans. Uh, let's see packet here. Um, so this days to harvest. And it says on there, your variety may differ. So there are going to be, so like these green beans are 53 to 58 days. And you can find that right on your seed packet. So it's pretty in line with that. Um, but, but it is good to check your variety because it might be a little different. So green beans should have maybe been planted based on that September date you should have maybe planted your green beans already but um, they are a good one and then um, carrots cucumbers green onion peas beets you can see those are all due july 15th um, so you would still be good to plant all of those and then we have summer squash and with a July 20th cutoff date, this one is 50 days to harvest. So that is still an option. And then we're gonna talk more about their, their cold hardiness, but these are all, um, all viable options for you. Salad greens, you can plant those um, in August. Um, kohlrabi, turnip, kale, um, all those can be planted in August, and then you can see spinach can be even planted in September. And that that double asterisk means, whoops, that they can tolerate they can tolerate light to moderate frosts. So your kale and your spinach. And you can see radishes are a very quick, quick growing crop, so you can plant those late as well. So it's important to know your crops. Um, and as I garden, I'm learning this more and more like that each plant is so different. And so you know your cold season versus your warm season. Um, there is a good chart in here for that. And your root crops and greens are gonna be some of your best bets um, for, for harvesting in the fall. And then another term that's used sometimes is coal crops. And this is the mustard family. Includes broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. You can read all of those. And they prefer 60 to 70 degree temperatures for their optimal growth. And they can withstand the light frost. So those are, those are some good options. So then I, I separated these out into what are the hardiest vegetables? Um, and these are, and going down the line, so these are the hardiest ones that they can survive down to 20 degrees. So we have Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collard, collard greens, and kale. Um, but then again, you wanna look at that, that days to maturity date. So Brussels sprouts, you might be you, you may have missed that opportunity, um, unless you wanna just take a gamble and try it. <laughs> you still could, but um, these are very hardy. They're, they will survive for you, so good options. Um, these I call the very hardy crew because they will survive in the high 20s. So we have beets, 
green onion and peas. The peas will take longer than if you planted them in the spring. So you might want to go a little earlier than that, um, just to be safe. So I, um, I'm right in the same boat if you have never done this before. I had never done this before and I don't know why I never, and I, I think to myself like, why have I never done this? Um, and so I am trying it this year and I'm trying peas and carrots and turnips and cilantro. And the uh, carrots and turnips are up already, but the peas are not um, and the cilantro is not. And I've just kind of noticed with peas, it seems to take them a while to come up. So I do think planting those a little earlier, you, you might be um, in a better place. These next ones are light frost survivors. So again, we use that September 15th date and uh, broccoli and cauliflower. Uh, we've got cilantro in there, kohlrabi, lettuce, greens, chard, turnips, spinach, radish. Those are all, um, they can all take a light freeze, a light frost, excuse me. So um, most of those, you're all still good to plant all of those. So keep those in mind as you have spaces to fill in your garden. And I call these uh, risky business <laughs> because um, they, they are killed by frost, but they have those short days to maturity. So you can try it, you know. Um, basil leaves will turn black if it hits the 40s. They're very prone to, um, to damage by, by frost. So, but, you know, a 30, 30 day to maturity, you can put that you know, and you can buy the plant. And so it might be worth a, worth a shot if you really like basil. <laughs> um, and some others in that category are bush beans, summer squash, and okra. All um, pretty fast growers, but, but keep in mind that they, they don't tolerate frost very well. And then I wanted to mention garlic because um, it's a, a fun one that you can plant in the fall. We did this last year and it's, uh, we, ha we pulled one and well, we haven't pulled all of our garlic yet that we planted from the fall, but it's fun to see that come up in the spring. And um, yeah, I think it's just a fun one to do. So it overwinters, you can harvest it around midsummer, July, around there. And uh, Rhoda suggested planting it with cucumbers. Is that um, is that for pests, Rhoda? Is that why? It's actually for diseases, helps uh, defeat some of the diseases on the cucumbers. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you can put that in your, in your cucumber bed. And then best after a freeze. I thought this was really interesting too, that some um, vegetables taste better after a freeze because the frost converts the carbohydrates to sugar, so they taste sweeter. So some of those that um, you're going to have best quality if you harvest them after several moderate freezes include parsnips, um, salsify, which I don't really have experience with, <laughs> and uh, Brussels sprouts. And I did um, look up parsnips a little bit. So their maturity, their days to maturity are pretty long, 95 to 120 days. So yeah, that's a pretty long day to maturity. But then when you keep in mind that they can tolerate those freezes and taste, taste good, um, I'm, yeah, I'm like kind of intrigued by trying parsnips now. <laughs> and it says they taste kind of like a potato, carrot, turnip, cross. I guess, but they said they taste sweeter than carrots. So when you are ready to plant, you want to gather your supplies. And this was something I hadn't really thought about, um, but it came from this book, Gardening in the Dakotas, and by Melinda Myers. And, but it is something to think about that um, 
obviously, if you're planting broccoli, cat, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, you want to start with a plant. And like I asked Rhoda, are those hard to find this time of year in a nursery? I don't really know, but um, I haven't really looked, but you might be able to find them. Or, you know, if you're planning ahead, you could start those yourself. And some of them are on both lists. Um, so like kohlrabi, for instance, um, you can do those from seed or from transplant. Um, just maybe what's what's easier for you or available. Um, and the same with lettuce. You could, um, and then it, they're recommending onion sets starting with a set instead of a seed. So I thought that was a good thing to think about. Um, I just use seeds. Um, I had the seeds already, and so it was pretty easy <laughs> to, you know, just gather the seeds, go outside and plant them. But with the plants, you'll have to think ahead a little more. So uh, germination tips in hot weather. So lettuces are kind of famous for not wanting to germinate in hot weather, and you'll see that in our, in our next slide. So you can look for heat tolerant varieties. Um, you know, you may or may not find that. Um, and that's okay. Um, it's recommended to sow your seeds in the evening. I did that. Um, plant in your shadier sections of the garden. And you can use shade cloth um, to help cool the soil down. Um, watering and I've been trying to do this, uh, keep the soil moist, check it morning and evening. And Broda recommended you could even put a white plastic bag on top of the soil to keep it moist, weight it down with something and um, that might help. You can over sow and then later thin them to their recommended spacing um, in case some don't come up in the, in the hot weather. And we're not really sure on the science of this, but but you can also try to chill the seed in the fridge or the freezer, here, like your lettuces, and that might help. Um, so this is um, soil temperature conditions for seed germination. And some of these are, you know, don't really pertain to what we're talking about today, but if you look at the lettuces, lettuce, the optimal, optimum, excuse me, optimum range for them to germinate is 60 to 75 degrees. So it's been hotter, at least in Rapid City, not today so much, but the past couple weeks have been in the 90s. So they're gonna have a hard time germinating in this weather and then they have a maximum of 85. Um, so, but like I said, my turnip seeds came up right away. And if you look here though, their optimum range can go up to 95 and they can even up into the hundreds. So, um, so that was kind of cool to see that um, it's something to consider when you're trying to germinate seeds is what, what temperature do they like? What temperature is their optimum range for germinating? And you might have to use some of those strategies to get them to germinate because you're kind of losing precious time. If, they, if you wait a week or two and they don't come up, then you, you might have to change your plan into what you're, what you're gonna plant because you might've missed, missed a window to plant some of the things. But hopefully these, these charts can help you, help you with that. So yeah, that might be kind of small to see on your screen, but I thought that might be helpful. And then, um, Rhoda recommended we talk about pumpkins a bit um, because a lot of people think um, that they are really frost, they're really hardy, really frost tolerant, um, and they will tolerate a light vine killing frost, but below 28 degrees, they should be protected. And at your, um, your pumpkin patches and things like that, you're, they probably are protecting those, those pumpkins <laughs> to, to keep them alive. Um, and then just a few other tips about pumpkins there, if that's something you like to grow. Tomatoes seem like maybe kind of a weird thing to be bringing up in this presentation, but um, it's happened to me, it's probably happened to you that our, 
our frost comes and we still have a lot of green tomatoes on the vine. So, so what can we do with those? I mean, you can try to protect your plants, but um, if that's not an option or you don't want to do that, um, you can harvest those green tomatoes and remove the stems, clean and dry them, wrap them in newspaper and put them in a, a dark, cool place. And then keep an eye on them and if they're soft or um, going bad, you can throw those out. And then they, when they color, you can remove the newspaper and put them back at room temperature. And another uh, suggestion that I've, I've never tried this one, but you can leave your tomatoes on the vine, pull, pull the entire plant and hang it upside down in a cool dark place so that in, and then harvest them as they ripen. So, you, you know, it might be messy. You might wanna think about where you would do that in a garage or something maybe. So those are some tomato tips for you. Uh, bottom line is it's a gamble. You know, it depends on our fall. Our South Dakota Septembers vary from up to the 90s down to the 70s. I remember a couple years ago, we had snow in August. So it just really depends. You know, it's, it's um, hard, you know, hard, kind of hard to predict what, what it will be. But, but you're usually not out a lot of money to try for a fall harvest. Why not try? Um, you know, I was just out a couple packets of seeds. So it's, I think it's like worth it to try. So for sure and watch the weather. You keep an eye on that weather. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some ways to protect your plant and extend the season. And a, a lot of people probably know you can cover them with a sheet or a towel and that can, that can save them. Another way is your, your humble milk jug. Um, they, in this picture, they cut the bottom off and they used it to put on top of the plants and protect them. Um, this method I haven't used, but I think they call it like a water wall. Um, and so you can fill your milk jugs with water, set them around the plants. The water heats up during the day and it gives off heat at night, which protects them. So that's, um, you know, a very low cost way to extend the season. And maybe if you, if you, you'd probably want to use that if you don't have a whole lot of plants, you know. If you have a really big garden, you might want to, you're probably going to want to think of some other, <laughs> some other, look at some other methods. Uh, plastic mulch is an option. It can give you a, a one to two weeks gain. Um, your clear plastic warms your soil the most. The black might shade the soil, so a little less effective. And these are Rhoda slides, um, so I'm gonna, I'll let her hop in if she has anything else to add on these season extension. But, um, and then the floating row cover is another option for season extension. You can hold it in place with soil or staples and gives you frost protection and um, some wind protection can also work as an insect barrier. You can reuse it. Um, you can't weed under there. <laughs> so something to think about. Um, and then must be removed for insect pollination. Also. A low tunnel is a, a pretty simple, low cost uh, method to use. We've done this at home um, just by using some PVC pipe and some six six mil plastic and it didn't take long to do and um, we even used it as like a hail covering if if we knew the hail was coming we could put it on and the hail just bounces right off um, you don't want to leave it on all the time of course that will cook your plants <laughs> but as it starts to get colder you can you can put that on and it will protect them and then this is a high tunnel. And this one cost only about $200 to, to build. So that really isn't um, that expensive either. And then high tunnels, 
can double your yield. Um, you can get better quality produce, can get an earlier start and extend your season. Easy to work in and um, they can pay for themselves in one to three years. So might be something to, to consider. And that one's not huge. It wouldn't take up, you know, tons of space. And if you, if you run out of time, if you're um, just don't make it in with some of the, the dates that we provided, well, when is too late? It depends on what you're planting and you can always, you can always try. Um, but another good option is to plant green manure, to plant your cover crops, um, such as rye, oats, and leg legumes. And then you turn these under before crop maturity and they add organic matter to the soil. So, and you can do these, you can plant these near the final harvest and plow them down in the fall, or you can let them stand all winter, plow them under in the spring, or you can just do it as part of a rotation, like with those, with the, if you harvest those peas and you want to put in, um, just not leave it, um, leave a year, an empty space in your garden, you could plant a, a cover crop. So that is something I also want to try is, uh, is doing a cover crop and um, yeah. And we have some more, um, there's some more information about cover crops and some specific recommendations for thing in here. Some specific recommendations of types of cover crops are available in that vegetable gardening in South Dakota book. So I am gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Burroughs to, we had some questions submitted um, when people registered and she's going to uh, um, address some of those. And then if, if the audience has questions, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let our, our horticulture expert answer those. I'll I could I could try, but <laughs> I think you're you're in you're in good hands. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Prairie. Uh, did okay. So some of the drought tolerant vegetables. Um, it's kind of a weird year. It's, it's like it can't decide if it wants to be dry or wet, but we're, we're, we're shading on the dry side. Uh, pole beans, the, the kind that get long, uh, tend to be more drought tolerant than bush beans. Bush beans tend to be real shallow rooted. So if you uh, know you're going to have trouble watering your garden, go for generally the more old fashioned varieties tend to have a little bit more drought tolerance. Um, tomatoes have a fairly deep root system or can. Squash and melons do if they're direct seeded. So you don't want to start those from transplants if you want the roots to go down deep. Uh, when you transplant them that kind of disrupts the root system and, and so it stops going down. But uh, pumpkins, squash, melons, all those uh, direct seed. Are there plants that should not be planted together? You know, Companion planting is always a very popular uh, subject and you'll find all kinds of advice out there in all kinds of lists, even on extension sites. And I've been real rigorous about asking, well, is this really true or not? Um, so I've been looking for any evidence that would support or disprove any of these uh, kinds of, of commonly quoted, quoted uh, pairings. And there's actually very little research that's been done. There's starting to be a little bit more now and it, it generally goes to two sides. One is um, whether it's the microbiology, whether one plant uh, like the garlic uh, is antagonistic to diseases of cucumbers. And then the other is, does it help repel insect pests? So those are the two mechanisms that are usually looked at. Um, there are a few uh, plants that will take, put out chemicals that kind of claim the space for themselves. 
so that if you plant something else in that space, it may not grow very well. Peas and onions and garlic may be one of those, especially with the uh, what they call the walking onions, the onion, the perennial onions that get the little bulbs up on the top of the plant. Uh, they apparently are not good neighbors, especially peas seem to be uh, particularly bothered by them. They've done tests with beans and did not find the same thing. Uh, speculated maybe it was a temperature difference of when the plants were planted. Uh, corn and tomatoes, we don't recommend you put together because of the insect. Uh, the corn earworm also will attack tomatoes, uh, the fruit of the tomatoes, so you want to keep those separated. And then potatoes with vine crops, vine crops being like your melons, cucumbers, those that have long vines. Um, tomatoes, we usually keep our tomatoes and potatoes separate just because they can get the same diseases. So uh, you also don't want to plant tomatoes where you had potatoes last year if you can avoid it because they could pass on some diseases. Um, sunflowers in general are not real good neighbors. Uh, they do have what we call a lelopathy. Uh, their roots exude a chemical that's not friendly to a lot of other plants. So uh, those are some instances of, of plants that you might want to avoid planting together. <clears throat> some of the uh, lists that you see out in the, you know, on the internet or wherever, um, may have come from varieties that are no longer in existence. A lot of that's probably been bred out over the years. So getting a frog in my throat here. Okay. Uh, container gardens. Um, it, in general, you want to look for bush and dwarf varieties. Uh, those will also tend to have shallower root systems and you can see here there's a source for really good information in terms of how many plants you can put in a particular container and how large the container needs to be. Uh, the one thing you really got to watch with containers, two things that we don't think about in the garden as much. Uh, containers can really dry out quickly if it's a dark container. The, the roots may get quite, quite uh, warm compared to what they would in the ground. And uh, the other is if you're filling it, and you should, with a, with an artificial soil mix, not just uh, take a shovel and put in garden soil because that doesn't drain very well. But a lot of the, the mixes, soil mixes that you would put in a container don't have very many nutrients. So we need to add a lot more nutrients than we would have to in our garden. Our garden soil usually has plenty of phosphorus and potassium especially and calcium in it and those may need to be uh, added for container gardens. And I guess I've kind of started uh, with that. Uh, most of our soils has a mentioned half adequate phosphorus and potassium. A soil test will tell you for certain. Um, many soils are lower on nitrogen and need some ad added nitrogen. Uh, some ways to do that would be uh, blood meal or fish, uh, fish emulsion if you're wanting to go organic. If not, uh, lawn fertilizer that does not have herbicide in it. Uh, lawn fertilizer can be a good source of nitrogen. Um, early in the season when you're first transplanting, even if your soil is fairly high in phosphorus, if the soil is still cold, uh, starter fertilizer that has phosphorus in may help your vegetables to get a better start, a quicker start. Uh, clay soil, uh, do what you can. Um, with clay soil, you want to try to avoid working it too much. Uh, work in whatever um, organic matter you can. And then you might want to look at 
so, some sort of no-till gardening in the future just to keep from disturbing that soil structure once it starts once it starts to form if you go through and roller till several times a year on a clay soil it really destroys the structure and makes it makes it uh, uh, get a hard crust on it after a rain uh, makes it hard for the water to drain through uh, makes it hard for plants to grow in basically um, so if you're restoring a garden that uh, is now weed patch you know those weed roots actually may be helping break up that clay so uh, it might not be all bad bad news there um, but a good way to choke out some of those weeds can be a good uh, cover crop for you might want to just take a section of the garden and put it in cover crop um, uh, sorghum sedan grass they found can even choke out Canadian thistle so if it's watered so uh, that might be an option for you next <laughs> Hey, oh, we've been seeing a lot of this this year. <laughs> I had had two hailstorms in one week that looked like <laughs> what what uh, is in the hand there. Um, so this is the year for it. If you can, as Prairie mentioned, uh, put a cover over your crops. That's wonderful. Um, and more and more of us, I think, are going to start doing that. Um, Fortunately, when they get the really big balls, they usually tend to be wider spaced apart. So uh, sometimes they're less damaging than, than the medium sized ones, but uh, it can look really awful when you go out after a hailstorm. Uh, you want to remove any damaged fruit that's, you know, obviously bruised because uh, that'll just begin to rot. Um, I'd leave most of the leaves unless they're just hanging by a thread, but even if they're tattered, as long as they're still connected to the stem, they may be still able to photosynthesize and send uh, nutrients back into the plant. So I wouldn't be real quick to take those off. Um, you know, if it looks real bad, you might, <laughs> might want to look at replanting. And we've just talked about what you can replant right now. Um, Leafy greens, because the quality is so important on our greens, uh, in that case, you'd probably either try just cutting it off at ground level and seeing what new leaves it puts out and the plant might put out new leaves or just do a, a new fall planting. And I'll let it prairie talk about the resources. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rhoda. And uh, I, I think I missed a slide in there somehow. Um, but an another thing I wanted to mention is that if you're replanting an area that already had a crop in it, um, you'll want to kind of loosen the soil, but um, be, be cognizant that the plants around it you don't want to disturb their roots, their root systems. So just loosen up where you're going to plant. Um, and then you, but you also might want to fertilize. You, um, you might, you want to use some fertilizer before you plant or, or on those, like where, where you planted your seeds. And then I think Rhoda mentioned this in South Dakota soils, you, you probably just need nitrogen. If it's a artificial uh, raised bed container, then you might need all, all three NPK. Just a clarification on that. You probably don't want to add chemical fertilizer right next to the seed because it can burn it. But once the plant is up, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Or, or were they saying you fertilize the soil before you plant it? Rhoda. Uh, you can do that too. Um, Either way. With with nitrogen, we don't worry so much because that moves around in the water so much so easily. 
but if it needs some phosphorus or potassium, that's really where you need to get in and, and work that into the soil because it doesn't move around in the soil very easily. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, the fertilizing, I'm still learning about that. Um, so South, some South Dakota resor SDSU resources that we have available. I mentioned the, the Vegetable Gardening in South Dakota book. Um, we have a garden section on our website. They, we have a Master Gardener course that um, happens every summer. This year is the first year it's online and we have uh, had a, a really good response to, to that. So I'm not sure if it will be online or in person or um, a hybrid or what we'll do next year. But um, if you're interested in that, it was, um, I took the course. It was a really great experience for me. So I would encourage you to, to see if that's offered in your area. Um, we also are putting together uh, Grow Getters lessons. They're youth lessons for kindergarten through second, uh, you know, around that age range. And so the, I have the link there. Um, last I checked, we had one lesson up about soils, but we'll be getting more up. And some master gardeners helped us put those lessons together. There's um, like art activity, there's vocabulary words, um, there's um, like hands-on activities and things like that. And then there is also going to be some field trip videos. So they're gonna to go to McCrory Gardens and to the local foods education center on campus. And so you'll, you can tour those virtually with if you have a um, child, grandchild um, that you think might be interested in that. And we're also offering packets, um, they're free um, we're calling them Garden Explorer Kits that you can sign up for. Um, they're only available to South Dakota families, um, but if you would like to receive one of those, there's um, like activities in there. You'll get um, a mini basil planting kit, um, a Play-Doh garden themed mat that you can um, use and some Play-Doh, um, some things like that. So that is a resource and 4-H of course offers horticulture as a project area. So um, that can be a good, oops, a 4-H is a good thing to get involved in. And you can show your vegetables at the state fair, at the fairs and things like that. And then um, Rhoda has been more involved in the local foods conference um, than I have, but that is going to be online this year. If that's something you're interested in. Uh, anything else you want to add about that, Rhoda? Yes, it's always the first week in, weekend in November. So I think we're going to do a Thursday, Friday, Saturday uh, this year, uh, Thursday and Friday afternoons and, and Saturday. So um, stay tuned to that. We'll have a lot of different sessions on everything from from food systems to to uh, growing your own food or uh, possibly even butchering. So the wide, wide variety of topics. Yes, sounds like it. <laughs> um, so um, here's our references. And I just wanna thank everyone for, for tuning in today and let us know if you have any, any other questions. We have about 10 minutes left, so. Um, so far, no questions have come through in the chat box, but I did make a note that if you're interested in that garden pamphlet that Curry showed earlier, you can call the Rapid City office at 605-394-1722, and Paulette would be happy to mail you a copy of that book if you're not close to one of our offices. Yes, thanks, Stacey. Were there any questions from... Anyone who is with us today? I'm curious, have any of you uh, participants uh, done some fall or planting for fall? I 
Hey, this is Monica. Uh, yeah, I just put in um, just a few more what was left over from the seeds. Uh, just starting, I'm the one with the clay soil and two years of weeds and bought a house and trying to turn it over into part of it back into a garden. Um, so some of it came up. Um, some I'm sure rabbits got into, deer got to. Um, I'm sure I weeded out a lot of the plants, but I did get some radishes and put some more in. Um, got a little bit of corn coming up. So we'll, we'll see. I'm figured starting small is good and just keep learning and growing. And putting up rabbit and deer fence, it sounds like. Yes. <laughs> Nothing has quite worked so far, but I've been uh, a lot on Google to see what, what I can do. To, uh, sounds like fence is probably about the only thing that really works. Reliably. Uh, you can find all kinds of of information about deer proof plants, but uh, many times your local deer populations haven't read those references. <laughs> Yeah, and I found them, they just even like to come and lay down in the garden. Didn't even see a meeting. They just want to be there. <laughs> well, and I had a tree in my front yard that the deer were getting at the leaves. So eventually I had to go buy chicken wire and build a, a fence around this tree because it's only probably like eight foot tall right now. Yeah, they got an aspen in my yard. <laughs> finally uh, got serious about walling it off. <laughs> yeah, I can sympathize with the clay soils. It's, it's tough, Monica. <laughs> good luck. So I, I didn't know that it's better not to work it. That's, that's good to know. Yeah, if you're, if you've got cover crop or, or you're working in, you know, compost or that sort of thing, obviously, uh, you'll need to work that in, but, but okay. the less you disturb it in general, uh, the roots are able to form systems underneath the ground and then the fungi uh, that help really form soil uh, prefer not to be disturbed. So, so uh, they'll do, they'll do their better job better if, if they're not broken up every year. Okay. And yeah, I plan to do a cover crop. So that I thought that might really help. Yeah. Yeah, it mostly requires patience. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that you could do is take a portion of your garden and just put a a light blocking tarp or boards or whatever across it and just starve it for light and whatever's growing in it then will just gradually uh, break down and and so that's another option to try. Okay. That's good to know. Thanks, Rhoda. Are there any other questions? or comments about today's content? Well, you guys must have done a good job, covered all the content. Thank you, Prairie and Rhoda. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. Have a good day, thank you.